Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. If you are meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a professional theatre critic based here in the UK, and this is my stagey YouTube channel where I review the shows that I have been invited to go and see. Today I was at an off West End theatre in London called the Southwark Playhouse to see a very exciting new revival of the Broadway comedy musical How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. This is a very different version of the show in as much as it has a very different casting approach. The show has a gender-blind approach to casting this traditionally very predominantly male show. It's trans-inclusive, it's non-binary inclusive, and to a certain extent that does infuse this six-decade-old musical with a certain amount of queer undertones. And there was an awful lot I liked about this version of the musical. However, there were also some things that I didn't think were as well executed. I'm going to be talking you through all of my thoughts and feelings about this show today. If you have already seen this production of How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, or if you've seen a previous version of the show, comment down below with what you thought of it. If you enjoy this review video, make sure to subscribe to my stagey YouTube channel. I make videos like this all the time about all the shows that I get to see both in the West End and on Broadway and off West End and off Broadway and recently on a boat. That was fun. Every day is an adventure. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see my videos before everyone else. You can click on the link in the description and sign up to become a channel member. Now, let's talk about how to succeed in business without really trying. So it's come to my attention recently that there are a handful of people who really don't know that much about this show. So let me tell you a little bit more about the plot. This is the story of Jay Pierpont Finch. When we meet him at the beginning of the show, he is a window washer, but he is reading an instructional book that is going to help him to excel in the business world. Following the book's instructions, he very quickly gets a job working in the mailroom of the Worldwide Wicket Company, where he meets Rosemary, one of the secretaries, and also Bud Frump, the nephew of of the company's president, J.B. Bigley. Following the book's instructions to the letter, as well as deploying a certain amount of his own charm and nimble social skills, Finch is able to rise through the company's ranks uncannily quickly and navigate the usual kind of office scenarios like the office party, like workplace romances, like professional jealousies and nepotism. I think it's an enduringly very, very funny show and TV and film have depicted the office setting and the workplace setting so much, but we really haven't had as much of that in Broadway and West End musicals, so I think this is very welcome topically. I think it holds up surprisingly well because so much of what it is satirizing and poking fun at endures and continues in terms of misogyny in the workplace, in terms of the attitudes of these lofty businessmen. And even though it was written in the past, the notions are timeless. These ideas of ambition and ego and integrity, all of which makes it sound deeply profound. And it's really not. It's a fun, lighthearted comedy musical with a score brought to you by Frank Lesser, who also wrote the music for Guys and Dolls. The book of the show, meanwhile, is credited to Abe Burroughs, Jack Weinstock, and Willie Gilbert. And I think it's a fantastic book. The jokes are so sharp and so quick for something of that era. It's, like I said, it is still so funny, and these punchlines are just dynamite. Now, while Act One sees Finch on the rise, the show eventually takes a turn and he finds himself in a slightly sticky situation. He comes up against a workplace nemesis and the arrival of another character named Hedy LaRue complicates things even further as we introduce a little bit of romantic subplot to some of our supporting characters. The show has been revived a couple of times on Broadway, most recently seen just over a decade ago. But like I said before, this is a very different production. So let me tell you a little bit about what this revival is like. So if you have any kind of familiarity with the last few Broadway productions, this one is going to be incredibly different. For starters, it's on a much smaller scale. It's in a very intimate auditorium. The audience seating wraps around three sides of the stage. We have this one sort of staging backdrop with a couple of doorways and this one 
elevator door that moves across and some drawers. The band are stationed atop all of this. And then we have this playing space that extends out the front. It's sort of in the round, but only on three sides. The cast is also a little bit smaller. We don't have this huge ensemble of businessmen. And like I said, the performers who are cast in this, it is very trans and non-binary inclusive. And there is this gender flipped idea with some of the casting. However, they have seemingly very deliberately not changed much of the material. It's not that we are reconceiving any traditionally male role as a female role. It is simply that we are casting performers from different gender identities in some of these roles. So for example, you have Tracy Bennett, an actress playing J.B. Bigley, but as a male character. This works better in some instances than others, but I will get to that when I talk about the performances specifically. All in all, it has this slightly frenzied camp energy, which I really enjoyed. If anything, I would have liked for them to have lent further into the wildness of all of it. I really liked the costuming for that reason. I liked their bold uses of color. I had a few issues with the set. There was really very little that I enjoyed about this set. The one backdrop that we had looked a little bit cheap. The few set pieces that they brought on to create different spaces within the office building also looked cheap. They had this ladder motif to represent the climbing up of the corporate ladder, but the ladders were very underutilized. Occasionally they got used, but for the most part, people just avoided them. One was a ladder leaning against the set and the other was this tall neon ladder that looked really cool and changed color. But if the colors were meant to mean anything, then that was lost on me. Perhaps they were, and it just went over my head. Like I said before, it ties in with the idea of climbing the corporate ladder, which is what this show is all about but they were simply on stage there to exist within that metaphor and not utilized to help convey it, which felt like a missed opportunity. My biggest issue, mostly with set, but also a little bit with costume, was that we didn't get the sense of progression conveyed. You have Finch, this character who arrives in the company and is working in the mail room and gradually rises through the ranks. He gets these increasingly nice offices. His first office doesn't have a door. And then we have a lot of scenes subsequently that take place in Mr. Bigley's office which is meant to be comparatively very lush. He gets taken to all of these executive exclusive spaces and we get none of that because the stage looks the same constantly. We have this one table that moves around. We have spinny office chairs that don't get any nicer in quality and we have a ladder that is occasionally put up. In fact, J.B. Bigley's office, which is meant to be the height of corporate achievement, uh, really doesn't look that fantastic because they put up this ladder and it looks like it's being decorated. It looks like an office undergoing renovation. We don't get this sense of him having progressed up through the ranks of the company and not with costuming either. We get this one tear away where Finch goes from window washer to businessman, but then that outfit is kind of a constant throughout the rest of the show. In terms of the staging, this is a challenging space. I thought that some of the set pieces they had made the staging feel a little bit clumsy and the staging was often a little bit crowded. I felt as though Alexandra Sarmiento, who was the choreographer, was challenged by the limitations of the space that she had. I've seen a lot of things that she's worked on in the past and I think she's a tremendous creative talent, but I wasn't really loving any of the numbers that were created in this space because I think there were just a lot of limitations. Georgie Rankin was director and I enjoyed a lot of the moments of this direction, but broadly, like I said, I thought the staging felt a little bit busy and a little bit messy. And most of the really great laughs happened because there was one individual actor who was really nailing what they were doing or because the text within the script is still so funny, but it felt like there were as many missed comedy opportunities or punchlines that just fell flat. One big thing we really lacked was a sense of romance and the heart of the show. That felt almost entirely absent because we really lacked for romantic chemistry. And that I think was partially the impact of this reconceived casting. Now I'm all for this casting idea. I like something that blows the lid off of these old musicals and looks at them in a completely new way. That will not be for everyone. Some people are a lot more traditional in how they like for revivals to be staged. I love stuff like this, and when this casting was announced, I was so excited. But it only works 
if you allow it to be a showcase of those performers' talents rather than a limitation on their talents, rather than a box that they're trying to force themselves into that doesn't really fit them. When Company was rewritten for Rosalie Craig to play a female version of Bobby, it was exactly that. It was rewritten, it was reconceived, and they changed the material to suit her. Had she just had to sing and perform the show as a male character, it wouldn't have been nearly as well received. And she wouldn't have sounded as strong vocally because she would have been trying to sing in a key that did not flatter her voice. Now there are some comic moments and some sweet moments that are found within this show because of the way that the casting has been done. But it has also introduced a couple of issues. I do think that there is a general lack of romantic intimacy and chemistry between some of the onstage couples. I also think there are performers who are having to navigate some odd key choices because they've changed slightly, but broadly not too much. And what I feel as though it's lacking as well is any sense of vision, why we are casting it in this way, why we're staging it in this way. It opens it up to more performers than previously would have been able to be in this show, but I just don't get what it is that we're saying with it. It didn't feel like anything substantial was being achieved by highlighting anything within these characters' behavior by casting them in non-traditional ways. It felt as though it was just slightly whimsical, but it wasn't really saying much. I wanted to be getting something more from this. And while a scene like Annie Aitken and Tracy Bennett singing a romantic duet is always going to feel inherently a little bit sapphic and have these queer undertones, I wanted it to be more unapologetically queer. I wanted to have more of that. If you're going to approach it with this kind of a perspective, then why not dial that all the way up? I wish the show had been directed with the same boldness with which it had been cast and conceived. So let me tell you about some of the performances. We have to start with Gabrielle Friedman as J. Pierpont Finch. Now there is unmistakable talent here from Gabrielle, but I was not consistently convinced of them as Finch. This is a tricky role to get right, and I think it takes an incredibly charismatic and incredibly likable and charming performer. And not that they aren't those things, but what we missed was this little glint in the eye. We missed the wink with which everything in this show should be done because Gabrielle just felt sort of very purposeful as they were navigating through Finch's journey in the show, just executing tasks and having these conversations and then participating in these scenes. We saw a lot of machination going on. We could see the wheels turning. We could see them laying the things out, preparing for that character to come in, getting ready to have this interaction. We could see the plotting and the scheming. But without the charm of all of that, it starts to feel a little bit sinister and duplicitous. You just see someone who is lying to get to the top. And without feeling the desire and the drive and the want behind all of that. It feels like someone who just wants to succeed for the sake of success and not because they want it so badly. I think there needs to be more heart to Finch for us to really get on his side. Otherwise you have Finch and Bud Frump who just look like the same side of the same coin. I really enjoyed their performance of the song I Believe In You, not only because that was one of the opportunities they had to sing in a more comfortable key and vocally sounded much stronger on that than in some of the early moments of the show, which was a shame, but also because I got the intention behind that song and the pep talk that it was. I think generally in the second act, Gabrielle's interpretation of the role made a little bit more sense because that is where we're starting to see Finch going off the deep end and being a little bit more duplicitous before having this realization at the end of the show. But does he even ultimately get redeemed as a character or does he just get away with it all? Honestly, I don't know if we're meant to like Finch as a character in this version of the show. I really struggled to decide how I felt about him. Tracy Bennett as Mr. Bigley, meanwhile, she is such a formidable performer. And to me, it makes perfect sense to have Tracy Bennett playing the big boss of the company. Not only do you get the visual comedy of her being a relatively short in stature actress with this larger than life personality and this gravelly voice, but the way that she just deploys herself on stage, the absolute authority that she commands makes her so perfect for this role. There are shades of Trump in this, uh, this just sort of stubborn and insistent businessman who, despite all of that, 
does have a little bit of likability to him, I think because Tracy Bennett has this charm, even though none of what she's doing in the show ought to be as endearing as it is. In particular, in the scene where she first really meets Finch and is being won over by his trickery and by his plotting, she's very funny and very easy to enjoy in that, and she gets some wonderful comic moments throughout the show. But the one I really want to talk about, who just about stole the entire thing, was Ali Daniel. Ali Daniel has been putting in fantastic work for a while now, but this role is really bringing her to the front and centre of the stage, which I enjoy very much because I think she's tremendous. Vocally, she is a wonderful talent. She sings Rosemary's material beautifully. The song Happy to Keep His Dinner Warm, I mean, it just has such a lovely tone and she finds these brilliant comedic moments throughout it. She is hilariously funny and what she can achieve with just a line reading and just a change in her vocal delivery and just a facial expression. She's one of those performers who just, she's such an effortless comedian. She just knows how to use her face. When she wants a laugh, she gets a laugh and it lands with everyone in the room. She's also incredibly endearing. We really do feel for Rosemary emotionally because of Ali's performance, because it has so much heart in it. Another one I am desperate to talk about is Verity Power as Smitty. She shares many of Rosemary's scenes and there is not enough of her in this show because Verity is hilarious. She absolutely understands the tone and the characterization of what she is going for with this character, with this slightly grating New York accent. She is a strong personality. She is not about to suffer fools. She is just trying to navigate her work day despite all of the chaos and the silliness happening around her. Much of which is being perpetrated by Bud Frump, our sort of our principal antagonist, played by Elliot Gooch. He gets some lovely camp moments in the show. He gets some big laughs, and I think his comic timing grew a little bit stronger going into the second act. His characterization is consistent and strong throughout. You know exactly who he is. You know that he is the nephew of the boss who is very quick to use his connections to try and manipulate his way into a better position. We also have Annie Aitken who plays the bombshell Hedy LaRue. Annie is very funny. I love that she will commit to a character voice. I feel like she could dial her comedy up even further and give us full pantomime levels of ridiculousness and camp. I do think that she has that in her because in her scene with Tracy Bennett, Tracy Bennett as Bigley is getting more of the laughs purely because of how committed she is to the bit. And I feel like Annie Aitken could get on that level. Finally, someone who is wholeheartedly committed to everything he is doing on stage is Danny Lane. I've seen Danny in a couple of things now and this has been my favorite performance of his because it's just, so lighthearted and fun and just charming to watch, utterly charming. He plays a couple of different characters within the organization. The first one we really meet is the head of the mail room and he is singing this song with Finch where he is talking to him about longevity within the company and how he has achieved that by not rocking the boat too much. But while he's singing his vocal lines, just the way he's choreographed, the way he's doing this little tap and ballet steps sort of absentmindedly with his feet, just the showmanship with which he performs, the utter theatricality of it all. Watching him perform on stage just feels joyous and he absolutely understands the assignment, as the kids would say, which is to say that he gets the tone of the show and the comedy with which he needs to be performing. He understands that he is satirizing this corporate character in a very comedic way. Let's talk now about some of my favorite moments of the show. I like the song, I Believe In You. I like the way that it's staged with some ensemble members slowly moving around as if they have a turntable, which they do not. I like that they bring in some of the other members of the ensemble to play on kazoos while Finch is shaving his chin with a razor, kind of echoing the tune that he's been singing, but with this sort of buzzy sound effect because it's on a razor, that's what the kazoo does, that's very clever. I don't know if that's a feature of the show that predates this production, perhaps someone 
someone can tell me in the comments, but I liked that touch. I ought to be talking about Brotherhood of Man in this section, but it never really ignited for me. I don't know if that was because of the staging. I don't know if it was because it was a smaller cast. They used the 90s revival version of Brotherhood of Man that had Lilius White singing. In this one, it's Grace Kenya Mibwa who is playing Miss Jones. And she does a great job vocally. I just don't think we have enough fullness in terms of the band or the orchestration or the vocal arrangement to really take us to the thrilling place I want for us to get to in that number. Unexpectedly, the highlight for me might even have been Grand Old Ivy, this song sung between Finch and Bigley, just because of how wholeheartedly Tracy Bennett performs this, I think. It's it's one of the more earnest moments of the show. It's charming, it's lighthearted, it's funny. And I normally am not a big fan of this song. This is something I would absolutely skip in a cast recording, but I think maybe was my favorite part of the show. And I did enjoy several of the numbers. I have criticisms that remain, you know, there were parts of it where I felt like I was watching a decent drama school show. There were moments where I thought some of the cast were just lacking in a little bit of stagecraft in terms of how they were standing, in terms of the energy they were bringing on stage, in terms of projection, just some of those basic ideas, the slickness of the lighting cues occasionally. Very often we had actors only being picked up with spotlights by the end of their line. There was this one telephone prop in the corner that drove me crazy because they had to walk up diagonally through the audience to pick it up. But every time we went to them, they were stood on a step and then they went to go get the phone and then they came back to the step and then they started. So we had this tiny little pause while they retrieved the phone. And I don't know why they didn't just go and get the phone and then be ready in their spot or why they didn't have the phone slightly forward or the light slightly further back. It was an odd staging choice. But there is also a lot to like about this show and there are fantastic performers who are getting to perform authentically on stage in roles that they are not cast in often enough in current theatre. I love what they are doing with the casting of this show. I love that it's platforming this kind of amazing talent that we have. It seems as though they are having fun. I do think there is an even more riotous and impactful version of this that they could be doing, but I also understand the desire to just do it as written, but with a different take on the casting to say these performers can play these roles too, and it doesn't need to be a gimmick or a concept. It can just be legitimate musical comedy, which is what it is. But those have been my thoughts on how to succeed in business without really trying at the Southwark Playhouse in London. I hope you have enjoyed today's review. If you have, make sure to subscribe to my theatre themed YouTube channel so you do not miss any of my upcoming videos. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe!